I guess I never really thought that I would get a chance to even be able to pretend. So. Well, why don't we pretend? Let's pretend. Four hours until the morning bell rings. To some, the ability to decide whether or not you need to sleep would be a boon. The hours always tick away and every moment awake pulls us closer and closer to a point where we simply have to rest ourselves. And every hour of sleep is another hour we could be spending doing things, getting out there, pursuing that which we desire. At least that's what most people would think. But on restless nights like these, that exhaustion after a full day's travel would be quite welcome. Something to drag you into the embrace of sleep for a moment's rest. And you could always choose to sleep, Azram. But how your body functions now is unnatural. And it doesn't feel the same. Much harder to will yourself asleep without tiredness. And even more difficult when there's a lot on your mind. But as you lay there in this very cozy bed in the... Sweet dreams, sweet of the sleepy sheep. Feel the weight of Deville on the other side of the bed, facing towards you. He's fully asleep. And the sounds of the city beyond the blackout curtains in this room. How is Azram feeling? I would say Azram is feeling kind of restless. He just, he said he can't, he feels kind of like he's just like floating in like a lot of like insecurity, I guess. He doesn't really know if he should be apathetic or if he should be hurt or if he should be happy that he's just here. And so I feel like, I feel like he's just very like gray, very like floating in between a lot of different emotions that maybe will come up. And then he's like, well, that's, that's, that's not how I feel. And then, well, that's, that's not really how I feel either. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's fair. Um, there's a lot of other things going on as well. The memories of just a couple hours before and you know that conflicting feeling rising up of I don't know how to feel. And then also just those extra thoughts now that you have time to sit with them, things that you've been thinking about since your journey from the north of Weldon, your tearful goodbyes and your next steps forward. Is there anything that you're doing? I would say Azram would just kind of lay there thinking for a while. And eventually after he was like pretty sure that Alana and Deville were pretty soundly asleep, I think he would probably start walking around, wandering around. You slowly rise out of bed. No movement in the bed at all. It's just so soft. <laughs> There's not any disturbance for the other person there. You see your brother cross the room fast asleep. To feel also you're able to make your way out of your room. 
Are you leaving? Yeah, I think he would go downstairs. You very silently make your way through the door into the rest of the sleepy sheep. You can see that further down this hallway through the window where the curtains aren't pulled, you can see that somewhat jarring sight of faint sunlight from sunset and evening, though your body is telling you that it must be around 3, 4 a.m. at this point. But you're able to kind of take note of it, collect yourself, make your way downstairs. So making your way down the stairs, you find that even at this late hour, there's the light and almost musical sound of conversation, laughter. It must be well into the night at this point, though you round the corner at the reception desk and see that there is this wooden entryway where before they were unlit, fairy lights are sort of dangled and illuminating this archway, indicating that perhaps the bar is open. There's also the city to your right, though it looks like the streets have calmed down quite a bit, despite the light outside. I think Azram would go to the bar. Okay. You make your way through this uh, sort of wooden entryway past the reception desk. The sweet smells of coffee and cream floats on the air in a room finely furnished with small and cozy dark wood tables. That same cobalt blue and gold embroideries decorating each uh, facet of the room. And there's a few booths that look really cozy, especially cozy because there are some patrons that are just head down asleep, sleeping in those booths themselves. And towards the back of this room, you can see a bar that sort of comes out of the wall, um, made of finely carved wood with sheep etched directly into the design. Um, Beautiful glasses and mugs for both alcohol and coffee concoctions hang from the top fairy lights there glimmering through them and the windows the curtains are closed meaning the inside of here is rather dark except for the lights that seem to illuminate it sort of to emulate nighttime behind the bar you can see a larger taller older woman uh, with bouncy hair dark skin and the same curled horns uh, adorned in jewelry this time um, wearing like loose flowing silk clothes that are reminiscent of like a swashbuckler like a pirate almost with like sashes and such um and then laughing along with her the recognize uh the recognizable and robust form of elliot the owner of the sleepy sheep and as you enter you hear her sort of look out to you and say oh uh welcome in uh Take a seat wherever you like. I've got a couple open tables and seats at the bar. As I would probably take a seat at the bar. Okay. You make your way through. The conversation in here is nice. It's lively, but calm, quiet. It's not like people are tripping over themselves and uh, scream laughing and, and slamming down mugs of <laughs> ale. Everyone is just nice and pleasant at this time <laughs> in the evening. As you wipe your way over and take a seat at the bar. Um, the woman sort of leans over and is like, so, what do you have? Give me something that can clear my mind. Ah, uh, one of those nights, huh? All right, then let's, uh, see what I can do for you. Alcohol, coffee, milk, what are we looking at? Surprise me. <sighs> Dangerous. <laughs> Dangerous question, but I can fulfill that. Um... She turns around and she starts uh, make a reception check. Thirteen. You can see that she sort of makes her way back and you can see these 
bottles that are all vibrant, different shapes and colors, different sizes, different types of alcohol, as well as just different syrups and uh, um, a stove top there that seems to be uh, like brewing a fresh pot of coffee. Um, you see her basically <laughs> make you like, uh, what's it called? Like an Irish cream coffee or something along those lines. Uh, basically some coffee with a little extra something in it. <laughs> um, and as she's brewing, Elliot kind of turns and says, Oh, well, hello there. Uh, glad to see you this evening. How are you doing? I don't know if I got your name. Oh, my name is Azram. Yeah, that, that, that rings a bell. Maybe I did. Maybe? No, probably not. If you want, you can also, you can call me Azzy. Some people call me that. We oh, don't have to. Well, that's fun. It's like a little nickname. Sure. Oh, well. Uh, it's nice to see you again, Azzy. Yeah, it's... Interesting. It feels like we're friends already, even though this is our second conversation and the first one was transactional. Yeah, well, I mean, I want to make friends in the city. I... We tend to not really make a lot of friends in cities we go to and more... Oh, I see. And the woman kind of cuts in as she kind of leans over and, and pushes a saucer of this alcoholic coffee concoction. The light scent of caramel and a little bit of something extra wafting off of it, um, as she says. Oh, well, uh, that's to be expected. Those types come around. Um, adventurers, I presume? Yeah, yeah. That's... um. We started in Cineath. Oh, and Elliot kind of cuts in and says, like, they were the travelers with Deville, who, uh, they were the ones who came in with them. And she says, oh, uh, you know Deville then? Yeah, yeah. Um. Uh, with a fairly high insight check, uh, 25. <laughs> What does uh, this woman read on your face as you reply to this question? Because I read a lot just now. <laughs> I would say that Azram at first is like, for some reason, a little shocked that they brought up Deville. And then you can see the like thought process of how much he should disclose about him and Deville's relationship. And then he just opts to say, yep. Okay. I know him. Oh, well, that's fantastic. It's been a long time since he's come through the city. Uh, how long has it been? Elliot thinks for a moment and says, Oh, well, I guess it must have been about a decade. We've seen some of the other Doom Raiders come through here and there to visit, but Deville hasn't been back since, well, I guess today. Hmm. So you you knew all the Doom Raiders? I thought we did. Let me let me decide on an accent. <laughs> keep this in the episode. Keep this on the episode. I really want to give this person an accent, but I keep not committing to it. So I'm just going to give him an accent right now, viewers. Keep I, this in the episode. I uh, thought we did a long time ago when he used to live here. This is the woman at the bar. Mm. <laughs> Who now has an accent, so yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, they used to frequent this bar quite often. It was their favorite when they were still an adventuring party. Hmm. And were they, like, good at it? Good at adventuring? Oh, well, they came back alive every time, and they were, you know, working for some pretty big names in the city. I would say they were fairly successful when DeVille talked about you know, changing things up and what the future of that party was. I mean, it seemed like they were all in the up and up. And in talking to them, it seems like they're all fundamentally still together, except for, you know, um, Elliot kind of shrinks into himself as he kind of, almost like a memory comes up in his head, uh, a sudden realization, and he kind of just kind of quiets down and... The bartender, she kind of sighs. She says, Ah, yeah, that's right. Um, but yeah, 
it was、uh, victories celebrating here. Sometimes a couple, you know, cases that didn't go right, but they mostly come by just to celebrate, drink, comfort each other, whichever. We give him a place to stay whenever Deville was having problems with his landlord. <laughs> Landlord, he had problems with his landlord. <laughs> he, um, let's just say he he never set aside a good amount of money to do things like pay rent, or you know, if he brought things back, magical things that he didn't exactly know what they'd do. His、uh, the place he used to live apparently was a. Testing ground for those things, which led to a few fires here and there.、Uh, we don't talk about them that much. He was able to pay the city for that, and he's paid his court fines and everything like that. So he's no longer, you know, warrant out for his arrest, that sort of thing. Don't mean to worry you or anything like that, but he was kind of a a, a wild customer back in the day. That's so surprising. Oh yeah, I mean. My life seems like as lukewarm as it gets when you compare it to the life he was living. Wow, that's he's. I really brought that up. I mean, I, I guess you don't always have to bring up like your criminal record or whatever. <sighs> oh yeah, I guess it isn't something you really lead with in a conversation. But he seems like such a head on his shoulders. He saved me so many times. Elliot says. Yeah, I kind of noticed that he seemed a little bit more level-headed,、uh, but、um, he was—he got more responsible, I think, with time. I think he really grew into his role as a leader. You know, that group really looked up to him and Delilah. Oh, <clears throat> Delilah.、Um, the. Bartender, sort of looks. Is gonna make another insight check on you. Natural twenty. Read me like、That's、a like fucking twenty-seven. <laughs> What's going on? How does Azram feel when that name is brought up? It's the first time he's ever heard it, right? The bill's never. Yeah, he's never actually told you the name. Um. I think that he would just be like shocked at first hearing the name, and then he would like take a big gulp and just be like, "Okay, I'm learning a lot." Um, the bartender, she notices this, and then kind of looks at Elliot, who's still kind of pondering, like his next word. He's trying to like recall something, and then she kind of clears her throat. She's, <clears throat> I、uh, sorry, I. I um, Azzy, was it? Yeah, Talia. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yes. Um, I I knew I realized I never asked what your relation to um to Deville was. You know, uh, uh, certainly you met him in the years that he's been gone. Um, how how do you know him? Um, well, we I met him in Cineath, and、mm. um, he. Gave us a lot of jobs when we were first starting out, and interesting. Now、um, we're together、uh, in a romantic sense. They both kind of, oh, oh, that's fantastic! Oh, that's wow! You hear that, Elliot? And Elliot kind of, oh, ah,、uh, that's great. I, 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 he's a really nice guy, and you seem also really very nice. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy for him. I, I'm, I'm happy that he was able to. And she kind of hits him on the shoulder. He's like, ah,、oh, uh, I'm sorry to bring up. I don't know if you know. I, I know it's not that big of a deal. I, I've always kind of been curious about her, but. I never really wanted to pry. Ay, that's fair. Um. Well, um. Uh, I wouldn't want to say anything that you know. Deville wouldn't 
really want you to know, but at the same time, I, uh, I have stories if, of just them in general, everyone there. I, um, it was interesting. It was almost like we all grew up together in the city. Wow. And he was happy, right? He was happy. He was happy. Um, of course, when, when everything happened and we got the news, he, he changed a bit and he ended up leaving the city, but it makes sense. When you build so many memories with someone else, it's hard, I guess, not to see them in the in the places you used to go together. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to go um, to say it like that. Um, she kind of stammers. Um, and Elliot looks and says, "But I mean, he seems." also very happy now he was seemed very excited uh, we we were able to catch up a little bit um earlier tonight and you know his mood was a little down as to be expected from coming back but you know he seems happy now that's good that's all that i really would want she kind of lets down her guard a bit kind of diffusing this tension trying to pull apart these different layers of okay does this person know about this about Delilah how much does he know is it an okay topic to preach and she's kind of reached this point where she's just allowing herself to reminisce a little as she looks on and says well well it is really nice to see him happy it it reminds me a lot of the old days when he used to come in here how he seemed and yes he was down but I've seen that man very very in a bad place, if that makes sense. I've seen him really, really out of it. He was wild though. I'm surprised that he's on the straight and narrow. Well, as straight and narrow as you can be for someone who's trying to rebuild a criminal organization. <laughs> so responsible. Yeah, I mean, he is pretty responsible. He leads so many people, and it's it's really, really impressive. And the amount of times... You have stories, I have stories. The amount of times that he's just literally popped out of nowhere and saved my ass. I'm glad to hear that. He was worried for a long time that he wouldn't be able to you know, carry the weight that the both of them carried. And to hear that he's going strong and he's helping people and he's still out there doing something with that raider spirit. That's nice. I could barely even tell that he was um, all wrapped up in, you know, daring escapes and half-baked plans and snag racing. Snag racing? Hey there, it's Christian with The Break. Sorry if my voice is a little crackly. I've been talking like forever for like the past couple of days. So my voice is a little bit gone. Thank you for joining us for episode 37 of SoftPod, the Azurum Solo Session. That's right. Uh, from here on out, it'll just be who makes sense story-wise to go next up until they meet up again, which hopefully shouldn't be too long. 
there's a lot of wild stuff going on in these episodes, so I'm just going to get right to it. First of all, to start our announcements, we are combining again. Yep, we're combining just like some kind of Gundam with Dungeon Depths. That's right. We are having a giveaway hosted by Dungeon Depths and are giving away Moonlighter stickers. You can go check out our social media right now to see the details on these stickers, but they are absolutely beautiful. So go ahead, check out the details to win, and enter in this fun little giveaway. If you don't already know, Dungeon Depths is your one-stop shop, I said it right the first time, for quality gaming supplies with character. Dice, dice vaults, dice bags, apparel, stickers, soft pod merch, well you could have it all. Right now, for the month of November, they are doing weekly restocks on Saturdays. So go ahead and check out their store. The next restock should be this Saturday, which is tomorrow if you're watching this live, or far in the past if you're watching this any other time. Thank you for sponsoring us, Dungeon Depths. And speaking of sponsoring us, thank you to Roll20 for sponsoring us as well. That's right, we are a part of the Roll20 Spotlight program. You can also use the code SOFTPOD to get 10% off of your order. That's S-O-F-P-O-D. Roll20 is a virtual tabletop that suits all of your needs for battle maps, music, the works, you know it, you love it, you love playing D&D. So why not connect with your friends across the internet using Roll20? Speaking again of sponsoring us, we are sponsored by you! That's right, you through the screen! If you are subscribed to our Patreon, you are directly helping us keep the show on the air because it helps deal with the expenses of the show. Stuff like paying for programs, paying for the licenses for music and stuff like that. So it really helps us. Now I'd like to take a moment to thank some of our honorary bard patrons. Thank you to Isela, Jessica, Faye, Rowan, Katie, Elliot, Starry Spells, and Hannah. Thank you so much for supporting us. Just another quick important announcement. We are taking a break next week from uploading. Yes, with the holidays in the U.S. coming up, we are all going to be out of town next week, and no one's going to be around to hit the upload button on that there episode. No, I'm just kidding. We're just taking a quick break just to celebrate the holidays and to be around friends and family for a little bit, and then we will be right back at you the next week. I almost said next holiday. Next week. So, there will not be a post on Black Friday, which is November 26. Yep, I had to pause the recording and look up what day that would be. Softpod is going to be at Holiday Matsuri. No, it's not for a live show. It's actually just for a panel on storytelling and TTRPGs. That's right, the Saturday of the con, we will be there giving our little spiel on how we like to tell stories and RPGs and hopefully influencing people to, you know, get out of their comfort zone and play that character they've been thinking of and realize that it's okay to do certain things that the old guard has said is not okay. It's going to be really fun. If you're going to the con, come by and say hi. It would really make our day. The last thing is just another shout out to the soft chord. If you don't already know and you've reached all the way here, well, if you've been skipping all the breaks and then you decided at episode 37, like, whoa, what's this whole break thing about? Maybe I'll listen. Then you will learn about our community Discord server. That's right. It's where fans of the show gather and they talk about D&D and they talk about other things that they really like, like Animal Crossing and all these different god darn young video games. And it's really nice. It's just a really comforting community. So come on and join us. We have a live chat every Friday when the premiere happens at 5 p.m. Uh, so come on and join us. Also, thank you so much to the modding team of the Soft Chord because you keep that ship afloat. You really, really do. So thanks so much, mods. Okay, I think that's all. I've been up really, really long, and so I'm going to go to bed now. But I really hope you enjoy the episode. Bye! Oh, that's right. You're new to the city. Well, this might fall into a category of something that DeVille may want to keep under wraps, but Elliot kind of takes a deep breath. And it's illegal. <laughs> so let's quiet down when we talk about it, but... 
Deville wasn't an adventurer first. Him and Delilah both started in Lunastra as snag racers. What's you know, a, a snag racer? Well, you've seen the solid car around here, right? You know how fast they can go, probably if you've been riding around with Deville. <laughs> yeah. Well, you didn't hear this from me, but rumor says... A big legend of the city is that if you talk to the right people and make the right connections, you can be connected to an exciting part of the nightlife here at in the city. An underground racing circuit filled with excitement and danger and betting and and no holds barred snag racing. Something that is highly illegal on the streets of Lunastra but uh, still has found its way to be a pastime of a lot of the more free-spirited citizens. And Deville was started in that? Deville worked his way up the ranks of snag racing, starting from a scrappy kid with a big heart and a and a mud of a snail <laughs> and he took that snail all the way to the top I can't do you have pictures of this <laughs> do you have anything do you have any proof let's see wait one wait, wait one second wait one second right here we all started supporting him when he was much younger um, she goes through like a underneath the counter and starts rifling through like um, like a safe almost uh, you can hear and then you can hear her rifling through papers and you see her kind of take one out of this um, like a newspaper and just kind of put it down onto the counter as you turn it around um, you can see that the headline is like snag racing ring broken up um, by the Salankari guard um, and you can see what looks to be first of all like a it's not like a drawing of it. It looks to be like some kind of photograph of some kind, just like a, a snapshot of the time. It's really old, really grainy, really not looking the best. Um, and it makes sense because it must have been like several decades ago. But you see like this vibrant shot of... Salankari guard, these people in these knights' uniforms with these flowing silks, all chasing down these riders on these snails that are decked out in these accessories, like spikes and chains, and and just like it, tearing up the decoration to like a hundred. And Talia kind of starts pointing around, see right there, and kind of puts her finger down on the page, and you can see that like kind of hunched over um, the reins of a Salankari um, with like lightning bolts down the side um, you can see the long like wind whipping hair of a much younger Deville who is kind of got his like goggles on like a helmet that is like holding as much of his hair as he can while the other parts are just like get, getting loose at this point. Um, just riding a, a snail <laughs> like a bat out of hell. <laughs> oh my god. Can I have this? Can I Can I have a copy of it? Do, is there any way this is in print? Um, you know what? I've, I've held on to it for a while, but uh, maybe... You know, maybe it is something that is good to pass on, she says. As she kind of hands you the newspaper. I promise I'll cherish it. I'll cherish it forever. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no thanks necessary. Yeah, he and um, I hope it's all right if I talk about her. I, I don't know how you feel about that, but... No, it's fine. He and Delilah both were snag racers. Bitter rivals. <laughs> all the way to the top, fighting each other every single race until, you know, eventually they became a duo racing together to have joint ownership of the Shell Cup 
And then from there, they thought about forming an adventuring party to just follow those thrills. And the rest is history. Wow. Wow. I've learned so much. <laughs> kind of makes sense that he wouldn't really want to talk about those days, I guess. But, you know, Duel used to be... Well, a, a regular face around Lunastra. It's nice to see him back, but, you know, Talia and I both realized as soon as he got here just how much everything had changed. I think he realized that too. <laughs> um, there's like smiling and and laughing as they kind of reminisce looking at the picture going through more stories about bad spills that DeVille had in his rise to become a snag racing champion just like these exploits that he had had and they're all tinged with a little bit of knowing sadness is there anything that you would ask them in this time um I don't think so I don't I think that Azram would just kind of let them talk at him because I feel like he wouldn't feel comfortable asking specific questions about like their past I think he might if they were talking about a story he might like follow it up with like oh then what happened but they tell a good amount of stories a lot of them focused on the Doom Raiders in general and you learn a lot about them you learn about their exploits the Doom Raiders this adventuring party made up of um, people that you had met actually in Siniath um, now just working with Deville as almost co-workers for the Zentarum but Tashlin Istrid Suraj um they all come up in the story. People that you fought with. You're not extremely close with them, but you fought with. They helped you in the siege of Siniath, etc. And um, just alluding to this person, Delilah. This daring fighter who preferred to sweet talk her way out of trouble first and then let her fists fly if that didn't work. Hot-headed, but caring, and the more ambitious of the two, charging head first to accomplish what she sought to do and to protect those that she loved. And as they sort of talk, they talk very fondly and they say things in a way that you know, they're definitely watching their tone, but it's... They're not just reminiscing about somebody that, you know, used to be with DeVille. They're reminiscing about a friend. And... They both kind of sit there in the silence that follows, recounting these stories, these vibrant and somewhat either hilarious or daring stories. And they finally settle as the atmosphere kind of takes hold. And they both take sort of deep breaths, um, laughing to themselves, um, laughing along with you as you all share stories about DeVille and the different things and the comparisons between young DeVille and old DeVille and seeing this timeline of this kind of wild card person slowly turn into this overprotective person. Um, and Elliot takes a moment and just sort of says, Oh, I wonder if he's told Ruane that he's here. Who? Uh, Talia takes a second and says, Ollie, uh, you, he hasn't told you about Ruane? Mm, no. Huh. I mean, I guess 
they didn't have the best relationship growing up, but, um, no, you should always take time to see your mother. His mother? I feel like he may have been trying to keep that a secret. Something along those lines, Elliot. Is she in the city? Elliot kind of says, kind of shuts his mouth and says, well, I guess cat's out of the bag. Yes. That apartment that's been burned down so many times. Yes. His mother still lives there. His, his mother, it's not his blood mother, but you know. Where, where's the apartment? Uh, I believe it's on a corner in the, in the Gibbous Quarter. Let me see. A a corner in the Gibbous Quarter? Listen, I am, I, you know what? She might like the company. Here. She kind of takes a napkin, takes a pen, kind of writes down some directions. Says, if you wanted to give her a visit she loves talking about him as much as she says that she thinks he's a snot-nosed brat and then she kind of slides the napkin across to you by giving your directions to this home Azram downs his coffee liquor <laughs> gotcha is like thanks I might Maybe I'll end up around that area. I was thinking of maybe walking around the town. Maybe I might end up over there. I'm not sure. Maybe. Or I mean the sure. I mean the light in the city makes it so it's fairly safe to walk around. Though of course there may be some people. Just be cautious. Be aware of your surroundings. It's okay. I can handle myself. Huh. All right then. If you ever need any directions. Elliot and I know the city like the back of our hand, but um, just stay safe. Don't get into too much trouble. Aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> she smiles and she kind of laughs to herself. Says, "I haven't heard that in a while." Um, and uh, as Elliot looks and says, "Oh well, yeah, I may as well try and get an hour of sleep in one of the booths here before I have to." <laughs> open up for the morning, so if you need anything, just wake me up, he says as he kind of stands up and lumbers over to one of the booths and then just (laughs) asleep in one of them. There's not a bed? He can, okay. He prefers the booths. (laughs) Azram is like, thank you so much. Um, And I really needed this conversation to get my mind off things. Celia takes a moment, um, kind of takes your glass and starts um, getting ready to clean it, putting it in like the sink that's there. And she looks uh, over at you and says, you know, um, I haven't seen to feel that happy in a really long time. I was wondering what kind of person could bring that kind of happiness back into his life. And it makes sense that it's you. You seem very charming. Azram, at first, is like a little flustered. Like blush rising to his cheeks a little bit. And then he's like, yeah, people tell me that a lot. (laughs) I, yep, I'm sure they do. Don't make me regret my compliment there, but, uh, oh, well. Maybe it's good. You're confident. <laughs> okay, so where are you headed? Out. Out into the street. Making your way through, you can see the orange and purple sky, but the only difference is that the streets are fairly empty at this time. It must truly be quite late into the night. Um, go ahead. Uh, any particular place that you are headed? I would say Azram would start heading in the direction of the address they sent him, but I think the entire time Azram would be like, maybe I should just turn around. Maybe I should. Sure. Go ahead and make a survival check with advantage to see where you end up. 
following these directions because they they're directions and they're good they're still handwritten directions on a napkin to get you across the city basically um just for timekeeping sake i'll say that conversation probably took like an hour or so um and the walk maybe like another hour 30 minutes to an hour depending how long it takes 17 17 okay uh, i'm gonna roll some stuff You make your way through the chilly streets of Lunastra, the blue light just emanating from that center, the calmness flowing over you, but also, you know, the combined thoughts of what you are doing currently and why you are doing what you're doing, as you are about to meet somebody that supposedly is quite a big figure in DeVille's life. And also, it's around like 5 (laughs) a.m. Currently. (laughs) What the fuck is wrong with this kid? (laughs) The streets are lined with this uh, sort of jagged cobblestone in places. These places where the streets are worn and old. Like uh, like old American cities, you know how they are, where basically... um, they're just kind of old and they have brick roads still. And you're like, damn, horses walked here or something. But, you know, uh, as you make your way through, there are some people that are up at this night, people making their drives on Salankari. Uh, they don't look very happy to be doing this <laughs> this late at night or being up this early. Um, but the city itself is beautiful. And making your way through the green of the Harvest District And the smells of the restaurants still faint in the air despite everything being closed except for a couple food stands here and there. Eventually making your way through the green of the district into the sort of purplish, and it's even written on the directions, when the light transitions to purple, you're in the right neighborhood. Basically, you are making that transition when... Go ahead and give a perception check to me, please. No, oh, 16. You found yourself on this narrow road between the Harvest District and the Gibbous Quarter, this residential area of the city, on this narrow road that goes a little bit off the main thoroughfare and more into like the side streets, and you are being followed. What? You get a sense of it as soon as you leave the main thoroughfare and then it kind of solidifies as some of the skills you've honed over adventuring. You can tell you're being followed and with that role and these subsequent roles, you can tell it by about four people. Four people? What do you do? Do I know where, like, where, like, they're behind me, above me, on this alleys? With 17, uh, I'll say go ahead and make another perception check for me. Nine. You can, as soon as you're able to sense them, you can kind of hear some scurrying behind you. You're not entirely sure where. You know there's people behind you, but you don't know if there's any other people anywhere else. There, there's some. I'll say this: they're not really ducking and hiding out of the way, like, mm-hmm. like at some point, it's just that there is a group of people. There was a group of people that are holding a distance behind you and following you down these side streets. Azrim stops Mill Street. You stop in the street. And you hear people approaching from behind you. And first you hear the footsteps. And then you hear this sort of... This dragging. Of a chain. What do you do? Azurum... 
would probably turn around. Turning around, you see two figures. They both stood wearing these almost like very punk style clothing, if that makes sense, in, in a Lunastra sense. Flowing silks that had been cut into like jagged edges and like tank tops that exposed like a, a lot of uh, scars and such on their bodies. Um, and these wild haircuts as they kind of look over at you and says, well, I suppose that uh, you noticed who were here. Yeah, I did. Because I'm not dumb. What do you want? You're new to the city, right? Do I look like I'm from here? Well, you see, there's a couple things today that you've done that most people who are from here wouldn't do. What are you talking about? What are you ta- I just got here. What could I have possibly done? He's got this like cocky atmosphere, him and his companion. Um, they both have these long sort of chains with almost like a, like a spiked uh, metal ball on the end. They're just kind of dragging around. They look a little wacky, to be honest with you. Like, not like the most intimidating people, <laughs> but like an like an 80s anime interpretation of what a punk looks like. Um, as the other one says, Listen, alright? This is nothing personal. Our boss just told us to rough you up a bit. Because, um... You overstepped some boundaries and some manners. When? They kind of stop for a second, and then one of them kind of leans to the other and says, Did he tell you when? And the other one's like, No, he didn't tell me. He just said to go beat up, beat up this guy. And he's like, Well, oh, fuck, can't answer him that. And then, they, and then you could hear from behind you two more sets of footsteps kind of approaching you as they've got you cornered off in this alleyway. <sighs> Listen, when doesn't matter. <laughs> All right? I can't believe your boss sent you on a, a suicide mission. I'm I can't That's so sad. <laughs> you hear this guy? Listen here. No, you listen here. And Azram grabs his whip. <laughs> An elder whip materializes, and you hear, like, kind of steps backwards. As some people are like, oh, whoa. I'm sick and tired of this happening to me. Every <laughs> fucking place I go to, I do something to piss someone off. Listen, if you have a fucking problem with me, tell your boss to come tell it to me. I don't know what the fuck I did. I just got here. Make an intimidation check. Intimidation? Mm -hmm. 19. Um, Two of them... Oh, actually, let me roll. See who it would be. Okay. Two of them immediately kind of start backing off. Like, two from each... One from each pair, basically, starts backing off and being like, Whoa, 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 we didn't know this guy was a caster. And the the main guy who's been talking to you is like, Who the fuck cares? We ice casters all the time. Um, and um, I start walking up to the main guy slowly. He stands his ground, kind of gripping his chain as he kind of puffs, puffs out his chest as they kind of close in. Uh, you hear someone from behind be like, I mean, we got to do this. I mean, the boss is uh, the boss. Is the boss. Take me to the boss. <laughs> you. We, yeah. Yeah, you don't you don't you don't get it. You don't know who you're talking about, all right? I'm still walking up no, until I'm nobody, like uncomfortably close. Okay, nobody just talks. He's kind of, he's kind of backing up as you're like getting closer and he's like, "I know you don't just talk to the number one snag racer in the goddamn city, all right?" As he's kind of being backed up. 
I'm sorry. I just learned what snag racing was like 10 minutes ago. What? The number one snag racer in the... I... I I can Doris. All right. Listen, I don't have time to go into the history of snag racing right here, right now. I think that... Do you know a snag racer named DeVille Star Song? Oh, shit. Natural 20. (sighs) He kind of... His eyes... He says, what? What do you thought? What? Lightning Star Song? Yeah, Lightning Star Song. What are you talking about? The, listen, how do you not know snag racing, but you know one of the legends of snag racing history? You see, that legend and I... You see, we're together. So, if you fuck with me, you fuck with him too. <laughs> Make a persuasion check <laughs> with advantage uh, or intimidation, whatever's higher. Um, 28. <sighs> intimidation specifically. They Their faces just kind of drop. Can't be right. And no one's ever, no one's even heard of a Lightning Star song in years. But that, 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 you're, you're lying. Do I look like I'm lying? No. Why would I know that? Why would I know that off the top of my fucking head if I was lying? What kind of fucking lie is that? <sighs> hmm. Uh, make a perception check for me. 17. Um. You can see 17. How much? Apparently. Yeah. They keep talking with you as they're starting to back up. And they say, like, we can't just go back empty handed. All right. Whether you're talking about some washed up old legend or whatever. Washed up. I mean, he hasn't been around in a long time. We, you know, that's kind of like washed up territory. Do you want to die? Make a dexterity saving throw for me. Dexterity saving throw? (laughs) Yep. 16. You see, out of the corner of your eye, one of them behind you reach into his bag, and he has been reaching towards his bag for this process, which is what the perception check was for. They sort of rip something out of it and just, like this chain come flying at you, which you're able to duck right out of the way as it, like kind of like a bolo wraps around a street lamp and you see these arcane runes just a light across it and the street lamp itself just go out just as they are looking and said fuck that didn't work at all I said just fucking hit him and I'm gonna look at the person who did that and I'm gonna cast lightning lure at him and pull him towards me uh, go ahead. Uh, what is lightning lure? Is it an attack roll or is it a deck save? It's a strength save. Strength save. Fuck. Uh, natural three. <laughs> Doesn't save. <laughs> what happens? I pull him like right up next to me. <laughs> and it's pulled up right to you. And I get and I whisper in his ear. Did you want to go first? Because I can deal with you first. And as fear takes his face and the other three, now their friend being held hostage in the middle of the street, as this escalation is coming to a head, there is about two hours until the morning bell rings. And that's where we'll end.